We are live. We're going live. Hey, Brian. Hold on. Uh, it's still saying setting up Facebook. Done. Redirecting to the Facebook Live page. It says live on Facebook on my end. Oh, it does it? <laughs> yeah. We are live. We're live. We're, we're live right now. Hey, Brian. How Lucy. are you? <laughs> hey, I'm doing good. This is our first um, little episode of things that we're doing as we're all on lockdown right now. So I got my really good friend here, Lucy, she, business partner. You were selling real estate with us on our team, the Brian Prasad team. A few years ago, you moved to move back to um, New York. You're an American citizen, right, Lucy? You yes, I'm actually, I'm actually dual, dual citizen, dual. yes. Okay, yes. so you're originally born here and your parents have been in real estate <clears throat> for decades in Toronto and you you got in the business and you moved to the state moved back to the states and you've been a broker in canada for about 14 years during that time you've learned all the secrets to real estate investing the hard way rather than taking courses you actually did it so you've lost a lot of money you've made some mistakes uh, a lot most of mistakes important. <laughs> yeah and that that was your education right so mm -hmm. you've made some mistakes and during that time you've learned a lot and because you've learned so much, you right now you're helping empowering people to invest in real estate right now in the States. You have investments in five different markets. Which is the reason why I wanted you on Toronto, New York, Philadelphia, Indianapolis. And most recently you moved to Atlanta where you're buying uh, or you're focusing on single family homes because it, in Atlanta, at least, they have a really good ROI. <clears throat> so Lucy, thank you so much for coming on our first kind of webinar talking about the Toronto real estate market and the market in the state. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Brian, for having me on. Uh, yes, uh, we're all starting to get a little stir crazy, cabin crazy, cabin fever actually at home, yeah. homeschooling. So it's a, a nice little break to be able to talk um, about real estate with some of my, my best friends up in Toronto. So yeah, how are things absolutely. in Toronto? What's going um, on? I mean, our market is hot still. I mean, even though we're on lockdown, we still have more sales than we did last year. And stuff is still going in multiple offers. Um, it's pretty crazy how it's still happening. We should be on lockdown. Um, we're having more sales than last year. Sales are up every day. I'm checking the numbers. I think pre-construction, a lot of builders have closed their sales center. So pre-construction sales have kind of stopped. We're hearing anecdotal evidence of some real estate agents um, still doing sales as of this past weekend. Okay. Um, so pre-construction, I don't know, but on the MLS, I could track things and I'm seeing every day we're ahead of where we were last year. Stuff is selling I saw one condo. Um, I'm going to actually show it as an example. I got it mm -hmm. here in my browser. Let me just pull it up here. Um, I sent it to you on just a few moments ago. So I'm just going to pull it up. It went $130,000 over what the same exact unit sold in the fall. So I don't know what to say. I mean, our market is really strong and people are still humming along. Okay, I got it up here right now. Let me, this is our first time doing webinars. So we just want to show the screen and it is Google Chrome and I'm sharing it right now. Lucy, could you see this? I can. Yeah, so you see this condo sold yesterday, the, or it sold the eight, it's sold firm on the 23rd. It came up on the 18th. So it was right in the thick of things. It sold for 830,000. I mean, well over asking, almost $100,000 over asking. And you might be saying, you know, what does that mean? Is it actually, was it listed low? Well, take a look at what the same unit sold in the fall, November 15th, sold for 700. So it was even listed high now compared to this one that sold in November. And it sold $130,000 more than this one in November, the same exact unit. In fact, it's on a lower floor. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, they did a good job staging it, but they kept it vacant and they got multiple bids on this thing. And if you go to my Twitter page, I, every day I track what's going on in the real estate market and people are, uh, people are amazed or like they're thinking, why are we getting these sales? We're supposed to be on lockdown. Exactly. What's happening. But there was so much demand um, last little while. And maybe we're dealing with the momentum. I'm not recommending people jump out and start doing showings right now, but I'm just reporting things as it is. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, yesterday, we had 852 deals that were sold conditionally where they accepted an offer and 543 the same day last year. So the market's really strong. Um, so, I mean, I guess, I guess maybe to, to kind of like, <clears throat> because you're seeing a lot of news headlines, right? You're, you're starting yeah. to see economists are starting to come out and saying, hey, you know what, real estate, um, it will be impacted uh, with obviously everything that's going on. Um, clearly, you're starting to see in the Toronto market that it maybe has not gotten to that levels yet. What do you, what do you forecast? What do you see? What do you see happening or how, whether it will or will not impact the real estate? What do you think is going to happen going forward? I think that there's like uh, three schools of thought that's happening right now. And the first one, which I'm really surprised about is business as usual. If something comes up that fits what I'm looking for, mm -hmm. I want to go see it. And there are people contacting real estate agents right now, desperately wanting to see a new listing, but they're just unsure on how to act. The second thing is people scared where they want to sell right now because they're not sure if their job is going to be there in six months or what kind of income they're making because they're in commission sales, for example, yep. and just don't know what level of income they're gonna have. Or three, they're um, greedy and they wanna look for bargains and they're saying, hey, if the market goes down, I wanna pick up three new properties. So a lot of, a lot of all of the above right now. So if I were gonna make a prediction, our real estate market is strong and it's been resilient. If this thing lasts 30 days, 60 days, um, I feel it will come back just based on the conversations that I'm having. But it's weird. Um, November, you could, it was really hard to get people to go buy places and go out to look. And now everyone's jumping in. I mean, we saw that example where that condo sold for 700,000 in November when people were we looking and then everyone rushed in the market at the same time. So there's a bit of a group think right now, a group momentum where people just seem to do things at the same time. So what I'm seeing is people have still a lot of cash and most people still have their jobs and they're still looking. Every day I'm getting texts, hey, I'm bored. What do you think this property would sell for? And then I look, it's already sold conditionally. So I feel I'm having the conversations with 30, 50, 100 people a day. Um, other real estate agents are having the same thing and we're seeing business as usual, really. That's very, very interesting. I mean, obviously, maybe just to kind of um, bring it back to, you know, what I'm seeing over here down in the US, um, you know, I, I'm starting to see obviously with the shelter in place restrictions, um, you know, um, or lockdown or whatever you want to call it happening in New York and some of the major cities um, and other also other areas are starting to catch up to that obviously being a non is considered being a non-essential business um, especially as real estate agents um, you know doing their day-to-day -day may not be considered essential it is starting to have a bit of an effect right so um, I think if you kind of factor that in alongside with the fact that people are just listening to the news right now and kind of like they're in a bit of a pause, a bit of a scare. But yeah. I think you have to kind of remember that prior to all of this happening, there was actually a shortage of um, units available, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I'm looking at this and it just almost seems like if the new numbers come out um, down the road, and I'm sure they're not going to be fantastic. Um, I really think that, you know, it's almost like there's a suppression um, of the demand levels just because people can't access the homes. Um, some of the title companies aren't actually open for business. So things like that will probably, you'll see an impact. 
but I really think it's not indicative of the actual strength of the real estate market as a whole. Yeah, and it's funny, you're just talking about real estate in the States being non-essential. In Ontario, it's actually it is. They're saying us real estate agents, we could still continue to work, title, um, land registry, real estate lawyers, they're considered essential services right now. So over here, it seems that things will, I, this month, no question, this month, the um, market will be up from what it was last year, just based on what's been happening in the first 24 days. Mm -hmm. April, we'll see. We'll see what happens as this lockdown continues. It doesn't look like, I feel that just based on what they're, what they're seeing in Italy and, and South Korea, we have to do this um, social distancing and staying in place uh, just so the hospitals don't get overwhelmed. And I, 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 can't, I don't know. It really, the, the, I guess the answer to the question is that how long will this have an impact? What will we see? It really depends on how long and the economic ramifications of people not working who can't work from home are. In the States right now, Lucy, um, in Toronto, as comparison, we had record levels of immigration. And I think it was one of the biggest reasons why the markets start going crazy in January, February. Um, a lot more people were moving in and we're just not building enough to satisfy that demand. What's happening in the States right now with the fundamentals in certain the cities that you invest into? Yeah, so as you mentioned, like most recently, I've been um, investing in the Atlanta market, right? So you have some really great, strong uh, economic indicators, right? They have a ton of relocations into uh, the Atlanta market. There are a, more Fortune 100, 500 um, companies there than pretty much anywhere. Uh, that you find in the US. Um, and you're also seeing that they have pretty decent per capita income numbers, as well as, you know, um, building permits, all of that. I know just, just prior to everything that was happening, they're very, very strong. So um, keeping that in mind, it was one of the reasons why I actually started um, looking into the Atlanta market. And I actually just also picked up a, a residence there, right? Because I can see like how much. Yeah, like a house. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Awesome. I see the uh, amount of demand, right? Because that's at the end of the day. That's really what drives yeah. all of this is the demand. But yeah. as you're starting to, see, as you saw with a lot of places, there's actually a shortage of affordable homes. And what I mean, what I mean by affordable are actually homes that you know line up with where the per capita household income numbers um, come in at. So let's say, for instance, just as a, a quick a quick way to, to get a sense of that is what people can actually qualify when it comes to purchasing their homes, right? So if they're, and I'll use a bench, a number between four to six times um, their gross income yeah. for what they'd actually be able to qualify for. So let's say if they're making $50,000, right? Um, that'd be a $250,000 home, for instance. Yeah. Right? Obviously yeah. things matter like how much debt they're carrying, but let's just use that. So if you're yes. kind of speaking in that range, you're really, there just, there aren't really any homes and there's actually a huge, huge gap in terms of um, what they have available. In so Atlanta speaking, right now. Absolutely. And, yeah. and we're talking new construction at those price points, which is kind of exciting as well. Um, but again, they weren't building enough of them. So having those pressures there, um, you're also seeing the prices naturally going up just because of that, right? So once things I think blow over, um, you know, I know people are talking about the airlines going down and whatnot, but I think I was just reading an article where, was it Warren Buffett? He just kind of got in on the whole, he picked up some Delta shares, which is yeah. kind of uh, it's promising, right? Should we um, buy Air Canada over here? But anyways, <laughs> yeah, go on. So. Yeah, so <laughs> Delta being their hub, op their hub of operations is actually located in Atlanta. <laughs> So that's that that was a, a good signal there. But again, once this all blows over, I think that um, you know, sticking to the fundamentals, um, you know, you'll you'll see kind of like things kind of going back to the levels of where they are, and it'll probably surpass that uh, probably relatively quickly. Yeah. So um, in Toronto, we do have that affordability issue where you know people want to be in that six hundred thousand dollars <laughs> and below number. And in downtown, 600,000 or below gets you less than 400 square feet. 
and those condos still sell. And as you go further and further out, you could get bigger and bigger, bigger places for that 600,000. So in Oakville, you could get something bigger than you could get in downtown Toronto. But over here, before this craziness, everything under 600,000 new construction, which is gonna be a condo, it was selling out within a weekend. Are you saying that level of sales right now in Atlanta where they sell out in a weekend or is it a little bit slower? And I'm talking about hundreds of units over a month under that price would sell out within days of its release. Yeah, I mean, obviously working in the pre-construction condo, like I, I have experience working there where they just um, have like a, a one or two day event and they sell out the units for um, obviously for the lender uh, for the lenders to, to see that certain numbers have been hit in order to provide financing. Um, I would say that it's pretty aggressive down in the Atlanta area. I'd have to, but I wouldn't say that it it literally sells out in one day, right? Yeah. Um, but certainly, certain projects are selling out in a couple of months, and I'm talking from a single family home standpoint as opposed to condominiums at, at yeah. this time, um, yeah. which is still like uh, it's a tremendous it's a tremendous um, um, in terms of turnaround. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the. Uh, yeah, in terms of them selling, they're doing really great. So yeah, I, again, the right. demand is there. Yeah. Yeah. And um, are you seeing investors buy it or the actual purchasers looking to buy it? Yeah. So you're like kind of buyer, you're, like actual homeowners. Yes. Yeah, so you're competing with both. Right. Yeah. Um, you have a lot of investors. Obviously, they're coming down there for similar reasons. Right. You have really, really strong fundamentals. Um and job, right? Jobs is a key driver and you have a lot of jobs, uh, job demand in Atlanta. So you have the investors that are starting to flock down there. I know they're coming from usually very expensive markets uh, along the West and East Coast. So hello, California, right? New York. So uh, even the time difference, they're still coming to Atlanta. Absolutely, right? And not just Atlanta, you have people coming into the Midwest, right? You have like Indianapolis, for instance, right? But if you're looking for a market that to be in my, in my opinion, is undervalued um, for what you're actually getting, um, absolutely. And Atlanta is a fantastic market. Is, is that the reason why you move from New York to Atlanta? Because I've always noticed that New York has populate their population is decreasing. More people are moving out of New York than coming in. Is that mm -hmm. the reason why you moved out of New York? Because you could be investing in Manhattan if you want it. Yeah, I mean, certainly there's always going to be a bit of an allure uh, with Manhattan real estate. But you're starting to see, I mean, they've been pretty much having a difficult time, especially in their luxury segment um, for a couple of years now. Um, I think it's the high taxes um, that are kind of having businesses to reconsider where they're going to operate out of. Um, for people that are actually living in the city, the cost of living is quite high, right? Um, so you have a couple of factors happening and um, people are just looking to get more value for their money, right? In an area that has a lot of uh, growth prospects, again, like Atlanta, that's a great place. A lot of people are also moving to Florida, right? It's another area that... Um, people are are flocking to. So I think right now it's just New York. Um, right now they're kind of going through a little bit of a, um, I guess, a deflation when it comes to the population numbers. Um, it's not to say that it's going to continue on forever, but certainly I think there's a lot of other markets uh, that people are willing to explore. I can't hear you, Brian. Hello? Okay, sorry, I'm just having my some audio issues. Are you? <laughs> yeah. Okay, hold on. This thing is acting weird. Uh, okay, how about now? Good? I think we're great. Yeah, we're good. Okay, great. Yeah, so is there opportunities for Canadians to buy into these places? Absolutely. Um, I, I like to kind of um, frame buying in Atlanta, just especially coming out of an expensive market like New York or Toronto, it's kind of like, you know, when you could buy Willowdale um, homes for 200000 in year 2000. I mean, it sounds yeah. insane if you think about it. What are the prices now, Brian? I, I don't even know. Um, uh, you're but looking at between 1.5 and 1.8 for a building lot. Just for a lot, right? Like but I mean, with an actual yeah. structure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So here it's again, I look at it like turning the clock back like 20 years. 
um, and being able to pick up properties in the two to three hundred thousand dollar price range where the rents uh, surprisingly are quite high um, yeah. and you're able to actually from uh, a total yield perspective be able to um, find properties throwing off between 30 to 40 percent per annum so I mean that's that's an insane number right and that's just um, based on appreciation and rental cash flow and mortgage pay down uh, yep, yeah, and tax benefits, right? So you have cash flow appreciation, tax benefits, and principal redu reduction, right? So from yeah. those four numbers, um, you can easily find things from between 30 to 40%, which is phenomenal, right? Um, yeah. But even for those people right now that maybe are thinking, hey, is now a good time to get into the real estate market? I know there's, there's probably a, some schools of thought that um, they're probably worried about tenants not being able to, you know, hold down a job. And obviously that creates risk, right? In terms yeah. of um, being unable to pay for their, um, their rent. But yeah. I think we can also look at for people that who may be fortunate enough to be an essential business or an essential service uh, provider or someone, an employee. Um, I think right now, I know that rates kind of ticked upwards just because of the overall demand. Um, in app, and there's the number of applications. But I think if you actually take advantage of the programs that are out there, for, for instance, like the FHA and VA loans, um, you could actually, even with virtually no growth, a 2% appreciation rate, I think I just ran the numbers, it was a $270,000 property, brand new home in Atlanta. And I think it, would, it actually threw off 113%. And I know that sounds insane, but it was 113%. So I think that if you have that opportunity right now, um, you have a, a job in the, for the foreseeable future, um, being able to get in where you might have a lot less competition, quite frankly, right? Because that's one of the problems like markets like in New York and you know sometimes like even in Atlanta where you have more buyers than sellers or available homes. Um, this might actually be a great time for people to be able to get into a property um, with historically low rates and be able to um, invest in something for the long term. Because remember, like with real estate, we're not looking at a one year time horizon. We're looking at a five or 10 at the very least, right? Um, in terms of a time frame. So I think there's a, a lot of great things that people might be missing out on if they're watching too carefully to the news and listening to, you know, a lot of the stuff that goes out there. Yeah. So um, it'll be cool. So <laughs> actually, if people are interested in those numbers, I'll make a spreadsheet of an example of one of the deals Lucy has. So you can reach out to us if you want it. So I'll email me and I'll send you out that spreadsheet. Tell us about your burrs, your buy, rehab, refinance uh, properties that you were buying. Yeah, so just to kind of, you know, I and explain what burrs are. Sorry, it's more popular in the States because you could do that there and you can't really do it over here. OK, yeah. So it was just it's a strategy that you'll find around YouTube um, and on bigger pockets. Um, but for me, it was just something that kind of just kind of I it just I came across this. You're buying a property. So at, you'll find a lot of people that are buying homes to flip. Right. So but when you're okay. buying a home to flip. It's capital intensive, fine. It's capital intensive with, and you fix it up with the intent to sell it, Yeah. which is great. Certainly you can probably turn uh, a bit of a profit, but what happens is that you end up paying taxes on your gains and um, commissions. Sorry, Brian, <laughs> I'm shooting myself. We're shooting both of ourselves in the foot, but yeah. um, those are actual costs, right? Closing costs and, and whatnot. Um, one of the great things with this particular strategy is you're actually able to capture the equity um, that you've basically put in through sweat equity, right? So buying a property that may be dilapidated, that needs a lot of work, and instead of putting it on the market to sell, you're actually selling it essentially back to yourself, right? You're refinancing it for the gain in the equity and finding a property ideally where the rents are actually going to cover your, your new mortgage payments, where if done well and if done um and if you're lucky enough you're actually able to uh take out basically all the cash that you put in doing the investment right including the down payment 
Yes, of course, right? Because so, a lot of these properties, you're gonna have to, like I said, they're capital intensive. Um, a lot of them, sometimes they won't even appraise. So you might have to come to the table with cash, but by the time you actually end up taking out um, the amount you might have still, let's say between 25 to 30% in, but that's the equity gain that you actually created from fixing up your home. So it's kind of a way to, for lack of a better word, you're able to recycle your down payment. So how much cash are we talking about in US dollars? Um, so for instance, um, you know, so let me use my last example, right? So we have a property where we picked it up for 200,000, right? Yeah. And um, it appraised for 250, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, so you're able to get back uh, the majority of the money that you put in 75% loan to value, right? Obviously yeah. there's some closing costs that are associated with that and yeah. the rents are $1,600, right? So yeah. if you run through the numbers there, you are able to, um, you're able to cover the mortgage payments, right? And your expenses uh, with, with the amount that you actually financed with the rents that you're able to get. And then you're able to use that money to actually go and buy another property. Now, to be so, honest right now, Brian, it is getting more difficult to find those types of deals just because we've had such um, tremendous growth in the numbers, um, yeah. but they're still out there, right? But you so, still have to make sure the areas you're buying, there is demand. So what you're saying is that, um, and did you have to put the $200,000 in that example cash? You can get a mortgage for it and then yeah. initially. So, so you put two hundred thousand dollars, including renovations, into the property, and then it got reappraised at two fifty once the renovations were done. Correct. And then, how long did the time from where you bought it to the time you got your money out, including the renovations, was it? Yeah. So that process took it's, uh, the renovations took about five months to complete, just because you have the licensing. Uh, the LNI board out in Philadelphia, right? So they take a little yeah. bit longer um, for a full gut renovation. And then after that, I would say with the time to get it actually financed was an additional three months. So between eight to nine months. So after eight to nine months, you put your money in and then you were able to pull it out and then you got it all and then you could do it again and again and again. But the finding, and you could find properties that cheap there that easily that you could put in x amount of dollars or renovations and have it reappraised like that so so much higher yes um again they are uh, they're getting a little bit harder to come by but they do exist yeah. it's, it's uh it's actually a strategy that's quite popular um so like uh in philadelphia for instance right there is yeah. an area, it's it's rapidly gentrifying, right? So you have- Should home. we tell people what it is? Or <laughs> <laughs> because we don't want everyone rushing there right now? Well, even if they rush there, finding a property is quite difficult, right? Like all, yeah. a lot of those plots of land and uh, the homes that are out there, they've already been purchased by investors. Yeah. Uh, but you can always find a new market um, to, to kind of uh, copy the strategy, right? Yeah. So but yeah, if anyone's interested, they can always um, hit us up, DM or whatever. Yeah. Um, so for instance, those type of properties there, a lot of times, as I mentioned to you before, you can't actually, uh, well, the ones that I, I picked up anyways, they're so dilapidated um, inside. They basically need a total gut rehab. Yeah. So for a regular traditional lender to lend on, it's not something that they will lend on. So you so have to have that big cash. Having the cash, yes, certainly helps. But um, I will say that for that particular strategy, um, it's certainly worth it. But now if I look into the Atlanta market, I wouldn't pick up something in cash. I would just go the investor route, which is to put the 20% down because yeah. my returns would be a phenomenal as a, a hold for that particular strategy. Yeah. So Lucy, you're actually doing like a course and a seminar teaching people a lot of your investment strategies, right? Uh, yeah. So I actually, um, throughout the last few years, um, like I said, I was going through a lot of different things and um, I actually came across, I don't know if anyone, of course, 
you know, you've read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. But when I make this um, connection, it was, I actually came across my rich dad, right? So it was a gentleman that I was introduced to. Um, he's been investing for the last six decades, um, building everything um, from storage, mobile homes to, you know, brand new developments, hotels, um, you know, uh, taking companies public. I mean, you name it, he's done it, right? So I actually was introduced to him. Um, he literally, you know, taught me the fundamentals of investing, which I think was missing from everything that I was doing, right? I was getting a lot of how-to tips from YouTube videos and, and um, you know, articles and, you know, but trying to piece it all together, I felt like this was the missing piece uh, to the investing puzzle, which was the framework, the, the fundamentals um, and having a blueprint when you're actually investing in a framework to analyze your deals. That was the missing piece for me. And um, so I, when, once I found my rich dad, I actually approached him and I asked him to put together a course um, of a course that he was actually already teaching, but kind of on, in an online format. So I've asked him to put something together and um, we're actually gonna be putting this together in a short while. So if you go to Eventbrite, um, we can maybe link the details down below later, Brian. Uh, you can yeah. go certainly check it out. And it's gonna cover things like how to find the money, how to find the property and um, how to analyze the deals. Something as basic yeah. as that. All right, awesome, Lucy, appreciate it. When are we gonna do this next? Um, yeah, I guess we could do this um, is like on a, a, a weekly, bi-weekly basis. Yeah, whatever. tell us the stories and the, your deals and break down some deals for us. So folks, I hope you like this. We're gonna be doing this a lot, a lot more during this time and stay tuned. For this week, we're going to be doing a couple more of these, and Lucy will be on hopefully next week, right, Lucy, with some good examples? Sure. And we'll provide all the links, and we'll make some spreadsheets over the next couple of days, and we'll post them, and just um, reach out to us, and we'll be able to help you out. Thanks so much, for folks. Um, hope you're having fun time, and if you need any real estate help during this time, or if you have any questions, we're really keeping on top of the market right now, and doing whatever we can to help our clients, our friends through this kind of crazy time right now. So thanks so much, Lucy. Thank you again. We'll have a great day. Take care. Thanks, Brian. You're welcome.